Okay, so I think we are going to start. It's, it's my pleasure to um, introduce Dr. Lee today. So Dr. Lee, um, I met Dr. Lee at the American Thor Thoracic Society meeting when we were organizing one of the first aging group meeting that is under the umbrella of the respiratory cell and molecular biology um, section. And then since then we have been, um, I had the pleasure to be invited to provide a chapter in the new book that is going to come, one of the few on aging lung. And this one is going to be published pretty soon. And the title is Aging Lung and Mechanic Mechanism and Clinical Sequela. So we, um, we have been fortunate to be invited to give it um, a chapter on the lung disparity among women as they age. So Dr. Lee is an associate professor in the Department of Internal Medicine at Yale. She received her medical training at Johns Hopkins and then joined um, Yale as an instructor. She has been climbing the ladder. And um, in addition to being a physician, a researcher, she's also the director of research for the section of pulmonary and critical care over there. Um, Dr. Lee's research interest is tightly linked to being a lung doctor. And she has worked on lung injury, COPD, and physima, and sort of the umbrella of those studies have been innate um, immune uh, mechanism. And in the last few years, she has added to her portfolio um, aging. So she's looking at mechanism of the innate uh, immune system in the aging lung. So along the way, she has been um, very productive, publishing over close to 70 peer review um, articles and book chapters and um, providing books. Um, she also has been uh, funded by NHLBI, so the National Institute of Lung, Heart, and Blood. Um, like many of us, she's, I think, trying to get something from NIA, but it's not coming as fast as we would like. But she also had some um, uh, funding from the Flight Attendant Medical Research Institute. Um, so without further ado, um, Patty, if you want to share your data with us, you want to Thank you. Um, let's see. You could hear me now. So thank you, Claude. I invite uh, Claude and all, all the um, institutes and, as well as bar, bar Shop for this invitation. This is my first time in San Antonio. It's been a great stay. Uh, please feel free to interrupt me, especially if I start going into either medical or very lung-specific type language. Uh, because I'm used to a very interactive audience. So please feel free to have me clarify if I go through things and uh, a bit superficially. Just a brief outline is uh, I will go through some of the kind of our overall arching themes of how we're interested in how lungs respond to injury or challenges, go through very briefly experimental models that my lab has had uh, experience in, but I will only probably only focus on those that I think are a little bit more age specific or aging related specific. I go through just some clinical aspects of the de uh, definition epidemiology of emphysema and COPD for, for the non lung crowd. Um, and then what I find very interesting, this is all from kind of background literature, it's not my literature, but very intriguing links between lung and other age-related systemic processes because that, this, some of this literature has really kind of prompted my interest in looking at potential shared mechanisms between what happens in the lung with either injury or age and what may be happening systemically. I'll go through some more schema, schema rather than lots and lots of gels, more schematics on why we, uh, especially our in vivo studies, as to why we're finding this innate immune pathway, the toll-like receptor 4, and what I believe is going to be one of a, a downstream uh, cytokine of toll-like receptor 4, uh, the macrophage inhibitory factor, or MIF, that I will show you some data on, and how I believe that these two, this axis is really responsible for baseline lung maintenance, and how I think it may become related to aging and smoking-related disease, such as emphysema. So just in general, my lung is, my, my, my uh, lab is very interested in more of a, gen a very sim simple question. How do the lungs, which are constantly exposed to the ambient inhaled environment, as well as constantly exposed to the internal environment through its massive uh, microcirculation, it sees the entire lung uh, blood contents very, very quickly. Um, how do they deal with challenges? And I, I consider, tend to think 
of challenges or injuries is really something that it's really exposed, perhaps we're exposed to at some level or another, almost consistently, and clearly this being in the background. And what we know, at least in the lung field, is that the lungs have generated incredible reserve or kind of homeostatic mechanisms to really be able to deal with a variety of constant challenges. However, once these either become too robust, so the lungs lose their ability, we know that we see dysfunction, general dysfunction or injury. And in the lung field, I think you can really only do two, three things. You can have acute respiratory failure, you can get a destructive pattern, or you have abnormal proliferation of fibrosis. It really fits into one of these three categories. And what do we see clinically? In the clinic, we tend to see the acute respiratory failure, which we call the syndrome acute lung injury, uh, acute lung injury or acute respiratory distress syndrome in kids, it's called RDS. Uh, we've seen in our older folks especially who had any degree of smoking or significant smoking, uh, an emphysematous pattern, which is more of a destructive uh, pathology. And then, of course, you're very familiar with kind of the abnormal proliferative or fibrotic responses that can happen. And in the lung, it tends to be in the form of interstitial lung disease or fibrosis. Pulmonary vascular remodeling is also an abnormal proliferative response. And of course, we know about tumor genesis. So what types of models do we do to try to uh, address some of these clinically important syndromes that we see? At least at the lab, or at least at the level of uh, of mice or rodents, rats, as well as cells, uh, my lab has used a variety of models. We've done kind of hyalur ligation to impose ischemia reperfusion acutely in the lung, which actually gives you a very robust ARDS ALI. It's more of a surgical model. We've also used inhaled as well as systemic LPS or cecal ligation puncture, which gives you also somewhat of, a, somewhat of an ALI ARDS picture, but it's more akin to sepsis in patients or septic shock. And we consistently use a sterile injury or an oxidizing injury, which is hyperoxia. It's giving mice or cells uh, levels of oxygen in the level of about anywhere from 80 to 100%. And mice, after a few days, will actually die. It's a highly lethal model, and they will have a picture, a lung pathology that looks like acute lung injury, RDS in people. Chronically, what have we done? We do do cigarette smoke because that seems to be one of the identifiable risk factors for emphysema or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease in people. And what's little less well identified, but what we think is relevant, is if you just, even just aging alone, even being a non-smoker aging alone, seems to lead to this kind of rarefied, destructive uh, lung picture consistent with emphysema. And at the lab, at the level of bioassays or biological, kind of biochemical, bio, uh, biologic assays, we found that Although two extremes, that there are certain canonical pathways that seem to be involved in whether you are prone to ARDS or whether you're prone to more of a destructive uh, picture over time. And reactive oxygen species generation, especially uh, cell death, an apoptotic cell death. And one I won't show the data on today because it's more relevant to our ARDS models is uh, changes in mitochondrial biogenesis and mitophagy that seem to be really key kind of readouts for some of the common uh, responses to both these types of injury. Now, what do we see clinically? COPD, or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, is essentially just defined by airflow obstruction. It's kind of a generic way to di diagnose whether someone has uh, COPD. You blow through a tube, and if the person cannot blow out a certain amount of volume of air within a certain amount of time, you can be diagnosed with uh, airflow obstruction. You will sometimes hear chronic bronchitis and emphysema separately, but they're under this common term because we don't have great biomarkers or kind of physiologic ways to distinguish the two. Um, chronic bronchitis, however, is more thought to be more airway and mucus related with lots of mucus inflammation. Emphysema, which is what we tend to model at the level of animals, is more consistent, uh, tends to give the pathologic uh, picture of enlarged air spaces, destructive parenchyma, loss of elastin, and then you get this airflow limitation. So emphysema really is kind of a subset of the, what we call COPD. And what's been clear epidemiologically is that clearly there are gender, age, genetics, as well as exposure history. And I say age because we rarely see people with a diagnosis of COPD and definitely with a diagnosis of emphysema until they're about in their 60s or 70s. So there is a huge age component, but we just don't know what that is, whether it's just true, true, unrelated, or whether there's actually shared mechanisms. That seems to be an area of debate. 
What we know, do know clinically, though, is that over the last um, more than a few, few decades, COPD is the only chronic illness or kind of a major cause of death that's actually on the rise, whereas the others are either flat or maybe even decreasing. As of last year, the World Health Organization has now declared COPD to be actually the third leading cause of death worldwide, not just nationally, it's now worldwide. Uh, but we have very limited level, um, mechanistic understanding and we really don't have very specific therapies or, or uh, biomarkers. And what we see, and this, is having, I, this had to be dug out from literature in the 1960s, <laughs> because no one really looks at this anymore, but if you looked at a normal, a healthy, quote unquote healthy, non-smoking 80 year old lung section, and you compare to a, an unfortunate 25 year old who didn't have any known lung disease, but what's apparent is that there is this phenomena that's been labeled senile emphysema, however, but this rarefied loss of airspace spaces is kind of a known process even in a non-smoker. And although there is this kind of negative connotation with COPD, thinking, well, if you just don't smoke, you won't get it, it's actually very untrue because aging, even an ostensibly healthy 80-year-old can get this picture just from having breathed in whatever the environmental or ambient uh, challenges there are. And this is actually worldwide becoming quite, a, quite an issue because worldwide, even if you're a non-smoker, just from living in heavily industrialized or poor air, air quality control areas, your lungs will start looking like this with uh, consistent challenges. Uh, and then if you look at lung function, this is how we look at airflow obstruction. You're probably at your peak at around, you have 100% lung function at 25. There's a steady decline whether you smoke or not. It's just that smoking accelerates this. And we don't know what the reason for this decline is. Um, and I think it's very interesting that it could be age-related mechanisms. So many of the literature about COPD and some of the models I'll show tends to be mixed with cigarette smoke. Now, not all cigarette smokers get COPD or emphysema. It's probably a fair minority, maybe about 20% get overt COPD and emphysema. So there is definitely some susceptibility pattern. But what has been consistently true is that smoking, whether it's in people or whether it's in our, some of our murine models, is a reasonable pro-gerontologic or kind of a gerontologic stress. We know that in a, if you just look at facial skin and elasticity of your facial skin and just wrinkle production, everyone in the cosmetic world knows this, that an aged non-smoker versus an aged smoker at the same age, that the smoker will have evidence of premature aging, just even just facially compared to young. And we certainly know, and this crowd definitely knows, that their smoking-related as well as age-related um, changes systemically that um, is very difficult to deny. So we think that smoking is a reasonable kind of pro-gerontologic. But what about COPD specifically? If you look at COPD years, there's actually human data that people who smoke um, have short telomeres. That's been shown by a few groups. There's evidence of increased DNA damage in smokers as well as in COPD lungs. And this is actually in human lung tissue. And we certainly know that in human lung tissue that we can get uh, upregulation of senescence markers. And smokers all. That's right. So the, old, the best one is probably alpha-1 antitrypsin. They get emphysema, a very different pattern than senile emphysema, which tends to be a little bit more diffuse. But alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is an antiprotease, um, develop, will develop emphysema by the time they're in their 40s, maybe 30s if they smoke on top of it. But other than that enzyme deficiency, there's really not much characterization of what's happening without smoking exposure. But there are certain enzyme deficiencies. Alpha-1 is the main one. Mm -hmm. You showed that diagram comparing smokers to non-smokers right. mm -hmm. and declining lung function. Mm -hmm. what, what is the measure in there? What? So this is um, what we call the peak expiratory flow rate. So the amount that you could empty your lung within a certain set amount of time.
And the reason why, uh, it's somewhat of a gross measurement, but it's very well validated, at least for most of the COPD studies, is that the more you start losing elastin content, what happens is the lung tends to collapse and will actually trap air. And so your ability to blow out fully or a certain set volume is kind of indicative of the level of your lung elasticity as well as lung integrity. So that's the FEV1. one Force expiratory volume of air in one second. That's kind of a standard measure. It's been FEV1 alone, whether you're a smoker or not smoker, alone has been kind of connected with actually frailty, susceptibility to infection, and actually cognitive decline. The, the, you know, I kind of see lung FEV1 as really kind of a generic measure for not only lung function, but probably muscle strength, neurologic intact. But FEV1 is, is a reproducible. I think it's probably ref more highly reflective of lung, actually intrinsic lung capacity, but I believe it's also kind of almost a systemic measure. Because to, whenever, in order to perform an FEV1, uh, you have to have kind of like the coordination as well as muscle, muscle strength, as well as the intrinsic kind of lung elasticity to be able to do it optimally. So I believe it's actually a broader measure, but it is lung specific as well. It, it, it is reflective of lung function as well. And those are some of the things that change. What's interesting is that whether it's smoking related or you just take someone in their 70s or 80s, this expiratory flow, this FEV1, tends to be the, some of the first that drops. It's actually, thir you start losing 38 mils a year. So you blow out less, 38 by about 38 to 40 mils a year. You just lose that ability just from um, age-related changes. And this could be all structural as well as not just long. It could be your... It's not only just lung, your elastin matrix content, but it's actually diaphragmatic strength. You, and we also know that your costal vertebral um, kind of epiphyses get stiffer, so you don't have as much chest wall kind of, um, of flexibility in, a, in order to be able to expire. And we certainly just see it, it's accelerated when you smoke. So whatever is happening anyway that's going to happen over time just seems to be accelerated. And this is residual volume. So what happens is that if you cannot blow out uh, certain, certain volumes of air within a second, what happens is the, the air doesn't go anywhere. It just stays trapped. And you get increased levels of trapped air. And you'll see some of the classic emphysematous patients. They walk around, they got the big barrel chest, and they're really skinny everywhere. With it. That's all air. That, a lot of that is air trapping. They just cannot expire. And then what happens is if you can't expire and your air is trapped, you're taking small, shallow breaths on top of it. It's like having a balloon that hasn't been able to be pulled fully release, you can't take a deep breath in, and nor can you take a deep breath out. So you actually get very dysmic. It's like quite uncomfortable. Um, and then what else also happens physiologically, we know that there's a uh, significant amount of resp respiratory muscle atrophy, even just with age alone, but this is very prominent when you start smoking. Um, your gas, your, v dot, your gas responses are quite altered. Probably blunted as you age, but this is particularly blunted in some of our COPD COPD years, especially those, there seems to be some familial link to actually getting uh, hypercarbic, and some are very extreme, some of our COPD years. Uh, increased work of breathing, that comes from the air trapping. And then we certainly know that the increase, just generalized increased susceptibility to, um, to infections. Um, again, there are system, shared systemic aspects to both smoking-related people who have uh, COPD as well as kind of what we think is occurring with age, just age alone. It's cardiovascular disease. Our COPDers have marked elevated rates, prevalence and incidence of COPD, diabetes, hypertension, osteopenia, certainly cerebrovascular disease, uh, neurocognitive changes. Their rates, especially smoking-related COPD, has high rates of neurocognitive changes that's underappreciated, and of course the musculoskeletal and then immune, kind of relative immune deficiency. But what's not known is what's responsible for some of these lung age-related or even smoking-related changes. The general paradigm, at least for smoking-related, has always been this balance, that your lungs are constantly exposed to 21% O2, sometimes more if they've had to be ventilated, but that the lungs have actually a fairly good depot of antioxidants, antiproteases, kind of normal cell maintenance programs. This is actually quite robust in normal lungs.
And that's usually trying to counterbalance all the daily challenges that the lungs are exposed to. And what the general paradigm has been that whether you age, whether it's from inflammation from aging, or whether it's the oxidant production that increases as you age, or whether you have now superimposed an additional, tox an additional challenge such as cigarette smoke, that this imbalance is why we, lead, why we see COPD or emphysema. But this has still been a black box. These have been kind of all kind of uh, somewhat descriptive studies other than the alpha-1. Alpha-1 is probably the only protease as well as genetic study that strongly links that actually proteases and um, kind of uh, proteases as well as genetic susceptibilities involved in, in this imbalance. But uh, other mechanisms have really not been well known. And what we, just, what we found just accidentally actually from some of the mouse modeling is that the LPS receptor toll-like receptor 4, which uh, people have pretty much in most of their cells, most of their cells express this on the cell membrane, uh, is involved, has kind of previously unappreciated roles in maintaining this balance. And what is TLR4 for those, just kind of as a brief recap? It's actually one of a family of transmembrane, whether it's on the cell membrane or the endosomal membrane. Uh, very distinct receptors that have the ability to recognize uh, microbial pathogens or microbial patterns, whether it's flagellin, whether it's gram-positive cocci, whether it's a gram-negative rod, whether it's uropathogens. Uh, mice have 1 through 11, mice have actually 1 through 13. In people, we think it's probably 1 through 11. And TLR4 is kind of the canonical, is the classic pathway when you respond to gram-negative rods. If you don't have, there are people who have a loss of function, TLR4 polymorphisms. If you lose the ability to respond to TLR4, unfortunately, you'll die probably of a, you will be very susceptible to kind of LPS organisms because the primary function, what's thought of this receptor system, is that once you ligate or once you activate TOL4, you get coalescence of coactivated proteins. You get very, very important kind of anti, anti uh, kind of immune function related or kind of defense-related uh, defense um, signaling pathways, and you essentially elaborate cytokines and interference that help kill off whatever that foreign invasion was, whatever that gram-negative rod or whatever the gram-positive uh, cocci is. And the mammalian system has really evolved very kind of pattern recognition-specific TLRs, probably because the mammalian system has decided that depending on what specific bacteria it is, you want to activate very specific programs. So this is the general, our general understanding of TLR4. But the reason why we stumbled on TLR4 and kind of non-infectious, so all the models I use tend to be more sterile, is that when we put these mice under a sterile injury, the ALI, ARDS, where they die a respiratory death, probably within about five days, if you don't have TOL4, what we find is that they're, they're very susceptible to this oxidizing, hyperoxic stress. There's, their lung tissue starts undergoing cell death, or undergoing both necrosis as well as apoptosis. They have lots of DNA oxidation. They uh, ha completely lose the endothelial barrier that keeps blood out of their lung spaces, and the lungs start flooding. So they get very susceptible. And what's interesting is that the toll fort if you have a double knockout, because sometimes these are thought to homo <clears throat> heterodimerize or at least signal together, if you have a double knockout, they look just like the knockouts, the TOL4 knockouts. The double knockout are very susceptible to bleomycin-induced uh, lung injury and fibrosis, and they're also very uh, susceptible to this hyperoxic death. We've actually done the 2-4 alone. The 2s, at least in terms of hyperoxia, look very similar to wild types, so we think it's actually the 4 that's driving a lot of this protective response. And what we find is that if we overexpress TOL4 specifically in the lung, we created lung transgenic using a CC10 promoter, so it's mostly in the epithelial cells. And we actually overexpress the human TOL4 transgene. So we use human TOL4, and we make the mice overexpress just in the lung. We can actually make them fairly resistant to this type of sterile injury. So we already had an idea that at least in terms of sterile injury or a sterile acute injury that they uh, that TOL4 is necessary. It's a very important protective response. But we accidentally kind of stumbled on this more uh, spontaneous or an age-related emphysema when we started looking at histology at slightly older mice. This is one month wild type. They look normal. This is normal alveolar space and size. This is at three months. Wild type stays normal. But the knockout started looking like this, what we had seen with the senile emphysema, with this rarefied, this kind of coalesced air spaces and very abnormal enlargement. 
it gets even worse by six months. Wild types stay normal, and the TOL4 knockouts look even more prominent. And in order to quantitate this, we do use long volume displacement as well as actual cord length, where we don't take into account, in case there's fibrosis, we don't take into account the interstitial, but we actually look at airspace enlargement. And the white is all the wild types, and the red is all the knockouts. And very early on, they're getting this long enlargement or this destroyed long picture, really quite early, three months. We don't think it's developmental because they look normal up until three months. But something happens between the two and three month mark, and their lungs get so large that we think they've kind of almost reached their peak by the time their peak in terms of what their rib cage can actually hold by, um, by six months, by 12 months. They kind of seem to plateau between six and 12. And when you actually look at some of the biochemical measures of emphysema or COPD, elastolytic activity is very high. They're actually destroying their elastin. And you could tell from the wild type, this is elastin standing knockout. On your normal lung tissue, like your 25-year-old, should have lots of black that's organized and thick. But the knockouts, by three months, not only have this airspace, but they've lost their elastin content. They, they're fragmented and short. So this kind of was paralleling some, sometimes what we would see uh, clinically. And this is the, the uh, elastin, this is a elastin standing for 30 versus an 80 year old. These are both non-smokers. Elastin is very thick and intact, but it's quite fragmented, actually disorganized and fragmented in older. Yeah. So in these lung enlargement cases, is the enlargement due to loss of elasticity or is there actually some homeostatic study? Yeah. So the only way we could answer that is, number one, that proliferation is actually, for instance, the knock, TOL4 knockout cells, their proliferation is actually down to normal. But we haven't looked at all the cell subtypes. We tend to look at some of their uh, structural cells, like endothelial cell, which we think is a very important uh, kind of homeostatic mechanism to maintain. You need normal lung endothelium to keep normal lung epithelium and then that's the homeostatic mechanism. So their proliferation is actually a bit decreased. However, they have, we haven't, we, we looked at, for instance, MMPs and TIMPs to see whether they have increased proteolytic activity of the very classic ones. The classic ones are not upregulated. So they're, they don't have lots of TH2 cytokine. They don't have a lot of inflammatory influx. They don't have lots of MMP activity and their inhibitors of MMP are normal. They're not lacking in their inhibitors of MMP, at least the ones that have been associated with COPD. So we were kind of scratching our heads because they overtly, other than just, this is, I think this is an end result when we see this, it's kind of an end result. We did not detect any of those changes. We haven't done a lot of proliferation, but by PCNA, they're either about the same or maybe even a little bit lower. Yeah. They do. So we've done both. We've had them completely germ-free, but you know, they're never completely germ-free. <laughs> uh, meaning, even if they get antibiotics and they're on HEPA filters and whatever, they're not zero, but they still develop it. So we've done two, kind of regular room and then ultra clean room. The way to really answer that would be, we would have to re-derive them, probably in like not obiotic, right? No LPS whatsoever. We haven't gone that far. But we did do the intermediate, kind of, a, kind of like a indirect study, which is at least in lung, we think LPS requires um, CD14. But we believe it requires CD14. So if you look at the CD14 knockout mice, they, do not, they don't phenocopy completely. What, they actually get a mild emphysema, but it's not to the level that's all for knockout. So we actually don't think it's completely LPS dependent. We actually think it's going to be endogenous. We think it's actually endogenous signaling. And um, that's the theory of another, another talk, but we think there's a couple of candidates for what could be some of the endogenous signaling that's lost if you don't have toll for. LPS may be part of it, but we don't think it's the whole story. Yeah. So, um, if you're looking at the CMR, you're at all of the factors stable for your partner. It has to be that balance. Yeah. 
right. over time as you age. Right. That's a natural age. Which they probably do, yeah. Which I'm sure. Yeah. Have, what, what they have to do if you're older. Right. So we don't know. We haven't looked at the upper, kind of more the ciliary, ciliary or columnar epithelium. Yeah, we have. Absolutely. And they are quite dis predisposed just from not having to four. We haven't looked. Um, the only, indir only thing that we've done with the more upper airway, with the, those that will be ciliated or probably upper airway, would probably be our our model where we drove TOL4 just in the CC10 expressing cells. And in a, that transgenic, we've actually crossed that transgenic to this knockout. So they have no TOL4 anywhere in their body, but they only have it in their CC10 expressing cells, so the Clara cells. And what's interesting is that if you give them TOL4 back just in those cells, you can actually partially rec rescue the phenotype, but it's only a partial. So I'm sure they have a role. I'm sure that the loss, that this would lead to a loss of ciliated. So we've done the reverse. We haven't actually characterized what happens to the, the specifically the ciliated uh, cells. I think it's very, I think it's going to be multiple cell types, actually. Because right now, we're just looking at the total body. And I don't show any of my, my cell-specific models, but we think it's going to be more than just, uh, we think it's going to be a variety of cell types. And then... When, we, when I speak to pulmonologists, they always want to know, well, that's fine, you're showing us a lot of histology and everything, but in patients, we diagnose COPD or emphysema by CAT scan. We just look to see how black their lungs are or how many holes they have in the lung. So we've actually started developing with our interventional radiologist who does a lot of uh, kind of microsurgery. This is actually a mouse. This is actually a TOL4. This might be either a wild type or TOL4, but this is just proof of concept just to show that we can do sagittal as well as cross-sectional and using respiratory gating because you have to get, they breathe so fast and breathing kind of gives them blurry vision, uh, blurry images. If we respiratory gate it and do a contrast dye, we can actually start looking at that parenchymal in a living, breathing uh, mouse. And then what the radiologist does is quantitate from a wild type to a knockout will quantitate level um, how dense or not dense their lung fields are. And this is just another way to quantitate emphysema. And then a little bit more going to physiology, how, how, how much compliance, how compliant are their cells. So it's hard to do total, total lung capacity in mice, which we can do in people but not in mice. So a surrogate marker for emphysema is how compliant are, is, your, is your lung. So when you give at a fixed pressure, what kind of volumes do you attain? And the knockout, this is a TOL4 knockout, this is a wild type. At every point, they're pretty consistently kind of more compliant, floppier. They just don't have that elastin content to actually give them normal compliance. And this has now become more the accepted way to look at, even in mice, to look at uh, emphysema or COPD is, to is by compliance and micro CT. And then there's a couple of other newer imaging techniques, but they're kind of hard to do. So what we'd ultimately like to do is try to translate some of our findings to human disease. They seem to have some sim reasonable amount of similarity to what we see in either smoking or senile emphysema. And what we're trying to see whether we could use this just as a modeling system to look at age-induced, age um, smoking-induced, and whether there are some underlying molecular mechanisms that are common to both. And the reason why we want this model is because if you looked at, if we were to look at age-induced COPD, emphysema, first of all, black six mice would take about two years. They finally do get a little bit of emphysema, but it's very mild, and it's at near the end of their life. And to wait two years has been very difficult. It's very difficult to do kind of consistently. And even in smoking-induced emphysema, black six mice are just fairly resistant to having lung destruction. It takes them six months of consistent daily smoking to get anything that looks like emphysema COPD. And even then, it's a very mild phenotype. So for our purposes, these genetic models, not only giving us a pathway to look at, it just ends up being a little bit more practical. I mean, our lungs get it in about three months. So we've, you know, we'd really like to capitalize this and see what these immune pathways are doing. And what if you take them out longer? A wild-type mice, maybe at the extremes of age, would get mild increases in their lung volume, kind of a surrogate marker for emphysema, but these knockouts, very early and then they seem to somewhat plateau. And so this is a hypothesis that we think that 
this, there are many aspects of the signaling clearly that we have to look at, but we believe that this signaling is absolutely key to maintain this. And what we found in some of our microarray data is that what this is doing is that it actually has an inhibitory effect on some prooxin as well as putative proteases. These are novel, this is a novel uh, protease. It actually doesn't have pure proteolytic activity, but I'll show you uh, from our recent publication what we think it's doing. And that this is actually a novel NOx uh, NADP oxidase. And it's only upregulated or primarily upregulated only in this model we were able to detect this. What we believe is that when you lose TOL4, we're able to, we, this is the shift that we see, is from at least two of these effectors. And we found these on arrays. On, uh, this was actually found on an array. This we found because when we started characterizing these TOL4 knockout mice, some, some of the lung lavage fluid, lung tissue, and their, pla and their circulating uh, blood, we actually found robust levels of, uh, oxidize, of uh, oxidants. And when we started looking at oxidants, we started looking at NOxes, the NADP oxidase, which is one of the key cytoplasmic oxidant generation, generators in the mammalian system. And we know of one through five, two is the one that everyone talks about in phagocytes, two, uh, two and four actually, mostly two. And two we know in people, if you are missing two, you get certain specific types of um, chronic granulomatous disease. So we know two has kind of uh, antimicrobial function, at least in people. Three had not been described. It had only been described in lung tissue, fetal lung tissue. But it was one of those genes that were thought to really just be very, very limited to uh, middle ear. And it's responsible, at least in air-breathing mammals, for giving, giving uh, equilibrium. But what we found is we actually were able to find high levels of NOx3 in our knockout mice. They're making abnormal levels in many of their cell types if you don't have NOx3. And we proved that in our uh, previous publication that if we give a silencer of TOL4 or we give TOL4 back to a knockout, we can actually regulate this NOx3. And so we think that TOL4 is having some important suppressive effects on NOx3. And CAD-E, cathepsin E, uh, these are the ones that usually are spoke, uh, talked about as being pro protease, pro protease in COPD and lung tissue, but it's not a cysteine protease. It's actually um, in a aspartate group. It's known endogenous substrate is still unclear. People haven't characterized it. It's been mostly expressed, at least in human tissue, in carcinoma and immune cells. And there was one knockout mouse of caddy made in Japan, and they found that these, these uh, mice, the knockout mice, are very susceptible to certain types of uh, skin, allergic skin reactions. So we, don't really, we didn't really know what caddy was doing, but it was very high in our knockout lung tissue. And what we did is we've generated, um, just to show proof of concept, that if you have too much of NOx3 or too much of CAD-E, that it's actually doing something in the lung physiologically, we, we can transgenically overexpress human NOx3, we can transgenically overexpress human CAD-E. In a mouse model, if transgene negatives look pretty normal, but if you give them, if they're transgene positive and these were inducible, we induce them, we let them develop normally and then induce them with doxycycline. And then what we find is that we get these holes in both of them. This happens, this takes about four weeks to happen in these mice. This happens within about two to three weeks. Yeah. These are all black six. Right. So other than this rarefication, these holes, they actually don't have a lot of inflammatory cell influx, neither of them. Neither of them. So they look, their BA, for instance, when we lavage them, their cell profiles look very similar to a wild type that's been unchallenged. We've actually challenged these mice to uh, oxidant injury. They look kind of like wild type. They, they don't behave all that differently, at least overtly, by, by injury levels and survival. No, not any differently than wild type. Wild type get mild neutrophilia. Now we haven't done LPS, which is more of a neutrophilic. Mm -hmm. 
uh, challenge, at least to black six, when we give LPS. We haven't done LPS in them. We might have done systemic LPS to see if we could bring on a septic shock response. They don't, they don't act, they, they actually don't look all that different from wild type. We haven't done it on the caddy. But we haven't done many, many models. Like, we haven't done bleo. We've, we've only done the hyperoxia. We kind of use it as a screening for oxidant responses. I'm sure they're quite abnormal because they're making high levels of NOx3. But in terms of cell recruitment, we haven't noticed robust differences. But what we have noticed with these mice is they do get, we don't know that yet how this is happening here, other than the fact that they're making lots of superoxide. We don't really know the precise mechanisms of why they're getting this destruction. It doesn't seem to be proteolytically driven. But we just published this, so I won't show you the primary data, but these mice, if you, apparently, Thepsini, we cannot find, at least in a slightly acidic environment, which is what they require because they're lysosomal. What's interesting is that Cathepsini, exogenous Cathepsini, and we see this in the lung tissue of these transgenic, have this robust ubiquitin proteasome activation. They actually have, um, they start losing, they actually have high levels of BAX, high levels of DRP1, which is mitochondrial fission. They, their mitochondrial morphology looks very abnormal, at least in epithelial cells. And ultimately, they actually start undergoing a caspase 3 mediated death. And if we give ZVAD to these mice, we could completely prevent, we could completely prevent this phenotype. And if we give DRP1, we can actually completely prevent this phenotype in vivo. And then we can do some of this studies with exogenous caddy that's slightly acidified. So we don't think it's a proteolytic pathway, at least for cathepsiny. We believe it's probably going to be. It seems to be either a cell death or a mitochondrial-related pathway for caddy. And we just showed this, so I'm not going to go through it. But we think that that's at least partially involved in, in this caddy. Yeah. In so very high. So these levels reach um, nanogram, you know, like 20, 30, 40 nanograms, whereas your normal caddy, endogenous caddy, is almost indetectable. So how high are they? So we don't, you know, I don't think we've done ELISAs on our TLR4, like how high they're achieving. We've only done message qPCR what their gene expression levels are. But oh, that's a good question. We do have the caddy ELISA. We haven't checked. But I'm sure the, cat, the TLR4 not making as much as this, as the transgenic. Transgenic is probably easily 20 to 30-fold more in protein, which is why we see this in two weeks. They look like this in two weeks. The TOL4 knockouts take at least three months. So the levels, I'm, I'm, I will be bet, will be lower. And like most transgenic, this is like super physiologic, right? This is, these are just high levels of caddy. But we could transgenically overexpress, um, we've transgenically overexpressed, uh, I see, what have we done? Not a cathepsin, but we've done other cytokine transgenic overexpression, and they don't get pictures, they don't get this destroyed picture. So it is somewhat dependent on the protein, but it is very high levels we're getting in transgenic. Yeah. So for emphysema, it's not reversible. For fibro, if it were a fibrotic process, probably. Because <laughs> I think mice have. What if you had used for uh, half the time, so you will take to get the uh, And then just turn the transgene off. Mm -hmm. Don't keep them, give them. That we haven't done. We haven't done that. Meaning like how long do you have to have it around to where that's perpetuating the injury. Um, we haven't done that. It'd be easy enough to do. We could give them doxycycline before they get to this point. Doxycycline, before they get to the point, turn it off, don't give them any, and then see whether they regenerate or they repair. We haven't tried. Emphysema in black six, it's reassuring that it's somewhat similar, at least, at least in smoking, for instance. They don't, res they don't resolve. They don't, uh, they don't regrow any of their alveolo alveoli back which is an issue with fibrosis, because with bleo, if you stop it, they look good again. But there is no, once this happens, there's, there's no turning back. But if we did it earlier, we'd have to check, we could try well, it. I know why you did black six, but are there mouse frames that are more susceptible? Black six are the most susceptible to emphysema. Yeah, they're a susceptible strain, probably because the NRF2 is not so great, right? We think it's probably, much of it's probably NRF2 related.
but they are the most susceptible, of the genetic background, they are the most susceptible to hyperoxia, to cigarettes, which is why all the lung people tend to use black sixes. Balpsy, for instance, are not, they're not as susceptible. Is there another question? And, yeah. You mentioned Z-Vag You mentioned Z-Vag effects against this. Yeah. What, what did you give the QR for non-Vag? Z-Vag? We haven't given them Z-Vag. We could try. <clears throat> We could try. The only thing that prevented the toll 4 knockout from getting the emphysema was NAC. So we published that in, in the original. So NAC can prevent it. Uh, DPI, which is a NOx, generic NOx inhibitor, can prevent it. And the only rescue studies have been done is when we give back the CC10, for instance, a CC10 driven toll 4 into the epithelial cells. And we've actually rescued the toll 4 knockout with endothelial toll 4 but we haven't given any other chemicals. But we should try. The re probably the reason why I didn't give ZVAD is because when we characterized the apoptosis of the TOL4 knockout lungs very early on when we, still, when we initially found it, they don't have a lot of baseline apoptosis. But once you give them something like hyperoxia, challenge them, they get robust uh, apoptosis. That's probably why we didn't give it, but we should, especially if it's CADE related. We could see whether... And you know what's interesting is that the CADI transgenic, we only found CADI because of TOL4 knockout, but they have slightly different pathways. So for CADI, for instance, these transgenic uh, lung epithelial cells get lots of mitochondrial morphology changes, lots of fission, GRP1. But when we take the cells from TOL4 knockout, their mitochondrial profile is not as kind of robust. So we think there's they do they do bifurcate somewhere in terms of what the pathways they hit. Uh, so what, what we're trying to do, and these are still ongoing, is to actually do the smoking model in a variety of our genetically altered mice that, that are specifically TOL4 related, and try to answer the question whether we're actually seeing anything either in wild type or whether some of our transgenically either not, uh, knockout or transgenically um, altered TOL4 mice actually modulate some of the responses to smoking and just spontaneously just to age-related lung emphysema. And we're very interested in this question of cell specificity, which is why we created the airway epithelial human toll for transgenic. Uh, we now have the endothelial transgenic as well. As well. So we, those colonies are going and we've actually already started crossing them with a the knockout. I'm very interested in the SPC. I think if I could get a good, I guess, I was a little concerned with SPC because if you have an inducible SPC that's given doxycycline, I was a little concerned that because of the type of promoter that was used, you get some of the spontaneous emphysema just from having SPC RTTA in there. I'm told that maybe the newer mice might not have that issue, but I'm very interested in seeing whether SPC will, um, as toll 4 driven to the SPC cells, will have um, either a rescuing or kind of no effect on the phenotype. So we're doing a lot of cell targeting. And the, I don't show you any data today, but the other way we try to bypass some of these genetic models of either conditional or this uh, cell-specific transgenic expression is we give uh, intranasal uh, vectors. So we could drive intranasal human toll for transgene uh, just using by, by lentiviral cloning. And it gets, depending on what promoter you use, it actually gets very well into the lung. So that's the other way we'll do it. And then with the help of the Pepper Center, we've recruited a fair number of participants now. We're up to about 200 participants that are split either by age or smoking status. And at least in the older folks, we do have COPD, non-COPDers. And what we'd like to do is kind of look at some of these, these molecules and these readouts of interest to see whether we can translate some of our, um, some of our findings. And what's interesting is that at least when we took the initial, when we just did PBMCs and just looked for TOL4 responsiveness, and we look at TOL4 responses by using either 0 0.1, 1 mg per mil of LPS, and we look at either IL-6 or changes in TNF-alpha, what we found is the PBMCs, these are isolated from older, so over 65, or those between 18 and 65, there's a widespread, but what's interesting is that these older folks, we think they start at baseline higher levels of IL-6 and TNF-alpha. That's not unusual. That's not surprising. But once you start giving them 0.11, they actually, many of them have much 
uh, shallower responses in terms of their ability to generate TNF alpha from their PBMC. It seems to be somewhat blunted. Now, whether this bears out, whether they have COPD or not, or whether they spoke or not, we need more people to be able to tell. But at least on initial inspection from about, we had a group of about 40 or 50, or 40 or 50 here, uh, they do seem to have alterations, at least at least in their responsivity. And we know... And I'm sorry, the, the, the It's the same. So whether we go from 0 to 0.1, so we go 0 to 0.1 and then measure the TNF, and then we have another set one from 0.1 to 1, it's equivalent. It's just as shallow. So you, they seem pretty identical. But when we look at gene expression arrays, there are large lung tissue repositories of those with COPD of lung tissue. And when we look at their uh, transcript, it's not very, very high, but they, they're, they're told for at least at the gene expression level does seem to trend towards lower than those who don't have COPD. And then when we take the PBMCs from some of these cohorts, these PBMCs have already been kind of extensively analyzed for differences in transcript. And the PBMCs actually have lower toll for at least at the gene level. Uh, this was done for the COPD gene cohort. This was the LGRC, which is a repository. And other groups have actually started publishing, at least over the last, um, three or four years that uh, there, there does seem to be uh, a link between decreased TOL4 expression and either uh, emphysema severity and there is a loss of function SNP that's been uh, associated with a worse lung function or more evidence of COPD. So we think there's some indirect evidence that perhaps that this, is, this is a relevant pathway and then when we look at um, this actual t excised tissue, lung tissue from people they're all smokers, but some smokers have no COPD, some have COPD. And when we actually do try to do tissue staining for cathepsinia and NOx3, what's interesting is that we can detect really high levels. This is representative. We've probably done about 16 slides of 16 different people. And on the lung sections, we can actually detect caddy. NOx3 probably has a different distribution. We don't know what these cells are, whether they're infiltrating cells. Endothelial cells are very hard to see on us human lung tissue specimens, but it's not in the epithelium. It really, we can actually detect high levels of the, both these proteins. So we think it may be playing a role. And I spoke about NOx3 and CAD-E, but we've also become very interested, at least because of its aging relevance, of this, um, this uh, cytokine that I briefly mentioned earlier in the beginning of the talk as being kind of another novel downstream effector of uh, TLR4. The lab, um, we only ended up on this cytokine because there was one cell paper probably 10 years ago that showed that MIF is potentially downstream of TOL4 signaling, at least in monocytes. And then the person who actually cloned human MIF happened to be on my floor and we were kind of talk, it was kind of almost like a water fountain talk when we ran into each other and he's a rheumatologist, Rick Rick Collar, and he was, I was asking him about this MIF TLR4 connection and he ended up having some data that showed that in his um, cohort of rheumatologic lupus patients, he found that those people with a, with a microsatellite polymorphism of MIF that led to low MIF expression paradoxically also had very low TOL4 surface expression. So he didn't know whether MIF was upstream or downstream of TOL4, but he thought there was a connection. So we started looking at this uh, protein. It's a secreted innate immune protein. Every cell makes it. It's usually preformed, so it's not transcriptionally regulated. It's always preformed and then released very quickly uh, in response to stress or infection. Uh, in monocytes, there was that one cell paper that showed that there was some actual physical interaction between, uh, not interaction, but at least signaling between MIF and TOL4, and it is a ligand for CD74. So that w that's what was known. There's some in vivo evidence that MIF is an important endothelial cell uh, factor. It has potent antioxidant as well as DNA repair properties. So we thought that perhaps this may be, this may be somehow linked to our phenotype of our TOL4. And it's known to have pretty strong ERK as well as AMPK and AKT signaling. That it actually, it's a MIF CD74 uh, pathway to activation of these pathway, uh, of these um, downstream regulators. And what's interesting is that when we looked at the knockouts of both the MIF and CD74, we kind of use this, this knockout as a way to just show us that it's MIF related instead of just MIF. And they phenocopy pretty closely our TOL4 knockout mice. They get this spontaneous age related, you gotta wait three months. 
If you give them cigarette smoke, they, give it, they also get this kind of uh, a much more of an exaggerated emphysema. And their cells are very susceptible to uh, hyperoxic cell death. So we have a smoking chamber. So we, we have two apparatus, actually. One is a, a single chamber, and one cell goes in one chamber. And the cigarette is burned, and then there, there's a nose cone, so that they're getting directly. It's actual cigarettes. These are research-grade cigarettes that have to burn through, and they're breathing in the, uh, the fumes, the cigarettes. And they, they are very interesting. They have very strong just like people, they get an addictive pattern. At first, they hate the smoke, they try to move away, they try to turn around, but after like the first two weeks, they know when the technician's coming in to give them the cigarette, they run into the chamber. Huh. They're very strong addictive, so. <laughs> so they certainly have the same neural pathways for addiction. They love it, they love the cigarette. And they can live endlessly in the cigarette smoke. But it causes, by six months, they get kind of this destructed uh, emphysematous pattern with inflammation. Smoking's a little different than just the age-related. They do get, they get qu quite a bit of inflammation. So, you put the, you put the damage into, the into these yeah, chambers. Into a, a, a chamber that's 70 or 80 response to the Oh, so the hyperoxia, we put them into a, a different plexiglass. They're in cages. That's open top, but the plexiglass is enclosed, and we bleed in 100% O2 continuously and probably achieve levels between 80 to 90% within the chamber, within the chamber. They, as smoke, or, oh, with the lungs, so they get that ARDS, ALI picture. They get very destroyed lungs, flooded with um, fluid, plas plasma exudate, within three days, usually three days, and they die by five. Most black six can't tolerate more than about five days. So between three and five. But this is, these are just unchallenged, and what's interesting is that they get this kind of air, airspace enlargement. The CD74 is more robust than the MIF knockout, and that's because CD74 actually has another ligand. It, 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 MIF is only one of its ligands. So, um, it's understandable that the receptor was maybe the funnel point for some of these responses, but they phenocopy pretty closely. And what's interesting is that when you look at, when you take wild type and give them cigarette smoke, at three months, if you look at their lung lavage fluid and look for secreted MIF, uh, acutely they're actually quite high. We think it probably is, is a protective or an adaptive response. But at the time at which they develop the maximal emphysema, or COPD, the wild type really lose their, this is Romare, this is uh, cigarette smoke. They, they have really low levels. It's, a, it's almost like they've depleted their, their uh, lung levels of MIF. And what's interesting is that when you look at the knockout, Romare is about normal, wild type acutely, this is at around uh, two to three months, they can upregulate levels. This is actually, um, is this BAL? Yeah, this is also lung fluid levels. But the knockouts, these TOL4 knockouts, really have very blunted production of this MIF. They just don't secrete it, they don't have much. Uh, and then this is all just looking at what happens just to a wild type over time. They have levels of, basal levels of two months, six months, but somehow, even in the absence of cigarette smoke, they kind of, they have, seem to have marginal levels by the time they're older. And this is actually, if you take the whole lung tissue of wild types, and look at them at four months, 12, 24, 32 months, they have almost undetectable levels of protein. And this is if we did uh, just quantitation. This is just quantitation of this densitometry of Western. And this has not only been found in lungs. There was one other group that looked in heart. In heart, MIF levels drop at the, at the older ages of MIF. No one knows why. There is some HDAC regulation of MIF. HDAC2 specifically is, is necessary for MIF regulation. Uh, but we don't know why, and we're kind of interested. And, what's inter and when we took our uh, COPD years, we had um, still limited numbers. We had 39, 42. They're all smokers, but these smokers don't have COPD, at least by lung function testing. These smokers have COPD. And they also have, this is circulating levels. 
so not lung levels, but circulating levels were also decreased. We don't know what the source of this myth is, at least in the circulation versus lung. Most cell types make it. So we're trying to figure out what's causing this decrement and what, um, what the cell source is. But we started looking at kind of downstream, what are TLR4 myth um, doing downstream, especially because they're both so susceptible, hyperoxia to age-related lung changes and to, and to smoking. And we started looking at kind of, you know, what we would consider the, the classic uh, pathways that have been somewhat linked to human COPD, such as DNA damage, telomere, P16, P19. And we started looking at gamma H2X, kind of the recruitment of these DNA, uh, DNA uh, damage, I guess, markers. And if we look at, this is already known, if you look at a wild type black 6, they do upregulate P16, at least at the message level. P19, there seems to be a decrement in CERT, at least by middle age. But what was more interesting was that if you took any of our knockouts, so if you took our TOL4 knockout, and you took it the MIF CD74 knockout, MIF CD74, TOL4, and we looked at P16 or P19, again, at the message level, they're really flat, but really early on, we're able to detect kind of this upregulation, at least of gene expression. And then we crossed our knockouts. We don't know where the cells are coming from. We think it's probably, these are total body knockouts. But when we crossed Norm Sharpless, we got our P16 luciferase mice from uh, Norm Sharpless at UNC. And when we crossed them with our knockout, this is a three-month-old. This is just the P16 luciferase alone. This is, there's no induction. If we cross it with the MIF knockout, we could probably see some. I think there's some, some in liver, uh, in lung, and probably, that looks, I think that's, I believe that's liver. But if you wait till six months, the knockouts really kind of uh, induce P16 pretty much in most of their tissues, whereas the wild type doesn't. And what we're going to do now is we're going to digest. So we, do, we, can, we have a fairly good um, way of now doing single cell digests from tissue. So what we're going to do is we're going to try to quantitate uh, which, cells, which cells and use cell type markers and see which cell, if we can try to identify which cell types are uh, are doing this uh, P16 induction. We did look at kind of just some gross measures of uh, uh, genomic stability by doing PNA fish. And then this is kind of, a, this is just, we chose endothelial cells for a variety of reasons, but this is just wild type uh, endothelial cells looking at kind of organized as well as kind of normally placed um, telomeres. This is again wild type. It's a higher power, lower power, these endothelial cells. But if you look at the knockout, what we just started, if you look at multiple high power fields, what we started noticing is that they have these evidence of kind of fused, interstitial, as well as perhaps what looks like breakage. And if we try to quantitate it, and this is low passage, high passage, pretty consistently we see more love, at least more visual uh, evidence of abnormalities in the, in the knockout endothelial cells. And this is if we give them this is just at basal levels, and if you give them an oxidizing challenge, like the oxygen, which we do in vivo, this is looking at gamma H2X, this is 5,3 um, five, uh, five, BP1, and the merged images at baseline, there's probably not that detectable, but the knockouts look like we're starting to detect more. If you give wild type endothelial cells hyperoxia, we can certainly detect more, it's expected <coughs> with an oxidizing agent. And then the knockouts are just quite robust. This is at least when we try to quantitate, at least in this preliminary study. And we can actually decrease some of this just by giving myth agonist. We, have, um, we now have small molecule myth agonist to Rick Bucala, who's uh, developed it at least for rheumatologic disease. And he, uh, if we give, these are just cells plated at room air. These are cells given, um, this is just control, scrambled SI. If we go ahead and give um, myth agonist, we can actually downregulate. Uh, evidence of uh, these foci, DNA damage foci. If you silence CD74, they look like as if you gave them hyperoxia, but then they, ha they don't respond at all to the myth agonist. So it seems to be that this, this uh, is through a CD74. And this is if we just do lung tissue staining of a wild type versus a knockout at six months, we can actually start seeing evidence of increased uh, staining in the tissue as well. And this is just more of a teaser because I don't know what this is doing, but we have MIF transgenic mice. These are not inducible. These are, these are just baseline, consistent of inducible. 
uh, it's considerably overexpressing uh, MIF, and it's long targeted. They make it in long epithelial cells, but mm -hmm. it probably goes everywhere because this is secreted. But what we're consistently finding is that if we took a transgenic versus a wild type, and these are older mice, we can see evidence. I mean, these mice, the wild type, actually look old. They have white hair. They're much less active. We've done kind of crossing the line activity assays, functional assays. They act old. These mice are incredibly active still in terms of uh, motor ability. They retain, they, they have very little of this kind of this uh, white hair. And we don't know if they've maintained fertility or not. We're checking to see whether they maintain fertility even longer than, uh, than the uh, wild type do. But these, but they're fat. They get big. <laughs> Yeah, they're these like 18 to 20. What? They're they're all either eight, somewhere between 18 to 20 months. Are, are you familiar with the data from the genomic lab with the whole? Yeah. Knockout? Yeah. So he's uh, it's the same knock. Uh, his knockout was on not on a black six. It was a mixed background. Right. It was a mixed background, and the knockout lived longer, but they eventually you know, they did, had less tumor genesis. But what's interesting about those knockout is that they had more lung tumors, but they had less of the hematopoietic tumors. And so I think the mice are dying probably, even, you know, the wild type mice are dying of hematopoietic tumors. And the MIF knockout just had less of that. But the MIF knockout actually had more lung tumors. So there, it was somewhat tumor specific. And I know, and in my mind, I'm not sure if longevity, how well longevity studies, even if you did the same background, how well longevity studies actually reflect what's happening in I don't know if it's such a great readout for a lung disease or not. But this is kind of, this is kind of intriguing because it might be possible that long-lived mice, the trade-off might be they actually get certain types of destructive lung issues. They're anti-proliferative, their under, cells undergo senescence, but they, don't, they start losing lung tissue, but they might live longer. But we don't know. And he's redoing those studies, actually, on a... <laughs> I mean, he was also expecting the opposite. Right, right. Right. That's right. And I think, though, it's clear it's probably different letting a mouse live in a lab environment and then just following them out versus just challenging them. Because these myth knockouts don't do well with challenge. They may live longer, but they actually don't do well with acute challenge. But we don't, I think they're going to have a metabolic phenotype. I think having high levels of myth is giving us probably another good they're, they actually have quite a bit of uh, body, body fat. I don't know if it's brown fat or white fat. I'd like to think because they look like <coughs> younger that it's probably brown fat and not white fat, but they're markedly different. So these are high levels of MIF just coming from lung epithelial cells, which is probably circulating uh, systemically. But we haven't characterized yet. Yeah. Really? Wait, so what's is ex less expressed of mitochondrial protein in ALS? The myth oh, so MIF has been measured. Really? Yeah. So we've actually isolated the MIF knockout, or we SI it, we'll SI MIF, or we'll get the cells, and we are looking at mitochondria, at least in lung cells, and uh, they're altered. They're, we think a lot of their susceptibility to hyperoxia and to the oxidizing stress is because they've actually lost uh, normal mitochondrial responses. So it's happening in the lung. I believe it's happening in the lung as well. Yeah. That's interesting with the ALS. So what would I conclude from this? I think it's all a matter of degree. I think what we're looking at balance, I'd like to think, I didn't talk about NLRP3 at all today. But NLRP3 is also very important in this pathway. And it's actually, we believe it's an ancillary or a concomitant uh, signaler through MIF. 
but um, NLRP3 has a slightly different phenotype than TOL4 until they get old. But I didn't talk about NLRP3, but what we believe is happening is that part of this homeostasis is normal amounts of MIF, or at least the ability to release normal amounts of MIF with day-to-day -day stress or infection or uh, an oxidizing stress, that we believe there is a signaling, normal signaling that occurs, and the signaling helps to maintain normal protease as well as um, anti-protease and antioxidant DNA repair, DNA damage balances. What we're thinking ha happens just in the older lung without any challenge is that we just think that the, this is slightly off kilter. It's not as bad as disease, but we believe that you're actually losing some homeostatic levels of TLF4, MIF, CD74 signal, and I think this is probably also happening as well. I'll, I don't show you that data. And so we think that essentially your reserve or your vulnerability is, your reserve is down, vulnerability is going up, or your resiliency, your tissue resiliency is, uh, is compromised. And then when we're thinking about things such as COPD, it's just an extreme. We believe that it's probably just an extreme, it, by this time it's already disease state that this is an extreme uh, version of what we may be seeing anyway with the unchallenged state, but an extreme version, and that this is why we see some of that kind of prominent phenotype of um, cigarette smoke susceptibility or loss of lung tissue. And we think that this, this is kind of a one part of probably a complex paradigm of what's happening, as to what, how they serve so, non-microbial functions. So during advanced Varies. So, no, yeah, yeah, because there are many different other pathways to get to that inflammation, other than just toll 4 um, Many of the readouts, such as IL-16, I mean, there are many there, and I also think it's cell type specific. It depends where that inflammation is, where the where the intact toll 4 signaling is, and where perhaps inappropriate toll 4 signaling is occurring, and whether it's your stromal versus non-stromal cell, I think the function is going to be different. And the reason why I think it's going to be cell type specific, especially in that in the human in human tissues in human lungs, I believe it's this this balance. I think it's it's dependent on structural cell. Now, if you have a macrophage that has this, all that might be doing is giving you predis a loss of this. That might just be giving you predisposition to infection, but actually not really uh, has no therapeutic kind of benefit. But we think that this basal level is probably important in structural cells. And the other part issue with human <laughs> tissue that have lots of inflammation is that um, it's also a matter of degree, right? If we give lots of LPS and ligate TOL4 and simulate TOL4, we can actually cause COPD. We can actually give you an emphysema phenotype just by giving you lots of LPS. So, however, a complete absence, you lose you lose homeostasis. So I think it's like most things in biology, it's you just need the right amount in the right place. So I think it has to be a structural cell. I think it has to be just the right amount of signaling. You can't overly, overly induce TOL4. But at the same time, you cannot have essentially either half or complete absence because you lose some of the other functionality of TOL4. And I think that's why human tissue is really hard because you're seeing kind of an end result, many, many ways to get to the, that inflamed tissue. And, um, and in senile emphysema, there's not a lot of inflammation. Maybe in cigarette smoke, but not in senile emphysema. So I think it's looking at two, almost two different processes. Yeah. So we've looked at... We've actually looked at all the knockouts. <laughs> We've looked at 1 through 11, and we looked at mighty 8 and TRIF. So it depends. So TOL4 gives you the most robust phenotype. Mighty 88 does give you the same phenotype. It's just not as evident, meaning they don't have as much lung changes, but they do have the lung changes. TRIF also gives you a partial response. So it's understandable because TOL4 signals through both. So the mighty 8 knockout and TRIF look like the TOL4, but they're just less prominent. But what's interesting is that for the NOx3 upregulation, it's completely TRIF. You need TOL4, TRIF to suppress NOx3. TOL4, the mighty 8, it has no effect on NOx3. So we think that they bifurcate, that, that there are very specific 
downstream effectors, depending on whether it's mighty 88 or TRIF. And the mighty 88 knockout, their phenotype is just not as remarkable. They have a little, they have some emphysema, it's not that prominent. Um, they do fine in hyperoxia. They look like wild type. They're not as susceptible as a TOL4 knockout. And uh, the NOX3 pathway is all through TRIF. So kind of interesting, yeah. Cat E, we don't know about Cat E yet, whether it's mighty E or TRIF. Uh, my, uh, TRIF. So that we don't kill them. Right. Is what? Oh, bagel tone. <laughs> that I don't know about. Uh, we're doing the model now. We're doing the non-lethal model now. So we don't know. In general, black six mice, given let's say 60 to 80 percent, so less toxic, they can live forever in there. They might have a little bit of fibrosis, weeks later, but the phenotype of a wild type black six given sublethal levels of hyperoxy is not that overt. Now the TOL4 knockout might have a more of a prominent phenotype. And vagal tone, I don't know, how do we test the vagal tone? Because you're thinking that there's some, the, the vagal tone in the lungs is, is uh, modulating the lung response. Just by, yeah. By simulating the vagus. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would believe it. Yeah. Yeah. But we haven't looked at, uh, yeah, no, we haven't tried phlebotomy or vagal tone. Can you see all your phenotypes? Right. So we haven't tried. So like if we did a rag knockout, for instance, like a mouse that doesn't have any T cells and cross them with a TOL4 knockout, something like that. We haven't done that. But remember in our spontaneous age-related model, they don't have a lot of inflammation. It's a very bland model. Yeah. There's no T cells. We see no infiltrates, but the toll, it's not as if the TOL4 knockout has lost its ability to recruit because when you give them hyperoxia, they, if, if anything, get more recruitment of cell types, lymphocytes predominantly, some macrophages. So it's not as if, but their subpopulations might be altered. We haven't looked at, we haven't characterized what they do in hyperoxia in terms of subpopulation. But in the aging, just kind of the emphysema model, there's not much uh, cell infiltration to begin with. So, but we haven't done the, we haven't done the cross. Oh, and just to get back to your question. Yeah. Because we don't think lymphocytes, we think lymphocytes is a like secondary or maybe even tertiary response to whatever. Right. So one way we try to, I don't think this addresses it exactly, but we do have chimeras. So we've made chimeras. Yeah, I didn't sh show the data, but we do have chimeras. So we've given toll for knockout wild type bone marrow. And we've given wild type toll for knockout bone marrow. It doesn't change their phenotype. So, yeah, which is why we started end up going to the structural cells, like epithelial. We started making an epithelial flux. We started having a transgenic in the CC10. So I probably glossed over that, but we have chimeras. So if you, if you trans bone marrow transplant them and then hit them with hyperoxia, a, a TOL4 knockout with wild type bone marrow looks just like a knockout. And then we cannot rescue the emphysema by giving them wild type bone marrow. So we, so we really think it's structural cell. And, I, and of the structural cells, I actually think the endothelial cell is pretty important. Because we could make this, we could prevent the uh, phenotype of both the susceptibility to hyperoxia and the spontaneous emphysema if we rescue TOL4 just in the endothelium, at least by Ty2, which is kind of not a great endothelium, and partially by VE. Um, and to get about the other tolls, so we've looked at uh, this, this emphysematous phenotype in the other toll for knockouts. So we've looked at 
uh, we've looked at one, two, three, four. Uh, we looked at one, two, three, seven, eight, nine, eleven, thirteen. 11, 13, uh, so mirroring tolls. And toll four has the most robust, and toll seven and nine actually have a partial phenotype. So the intracellular toll signaling through perhaps viral recognition might certainly be, be at play. And it's not surprising because TRIF look a little bit like emphasis as well, but it's not the other tolls. It's not one, it's not three, it's not two, <laughs> it's, it's not 11, 13. Four actually has the most prominent. And uh, people who actually were really instrumental, this is my lab, Praveen. I didn't show you any of the work from Praveen and Masha. Praveen is now assistant prof, so he kind of, he does all the CLP and LPS, but he trained in my lab. Masha has quite a bit of mitochondrial data and vascular remodeling. I didn't get to show you some of her data. All the data I showed you really was started by Su Chen when he was a postdoc in my lab, Yi, who is currently a scientist and my animal technician. Uh, Su Chen has now gone on to be assistant prof at pathology at Yale. Uh, but Su Chen Yi and Peng have really been instrumental in developing some of these toll for doing all these crosses and these uh, cell targeted toll for um, models. Mo Ward is now an instructor, but he trained in my lab and he did much of the myth work. He's he's kind of kind of spearheaded that. Jinna has gone on to pharmacy school, but while she was a postdoc in my lab, she uh, did all the PNA fish and DNA damage. And Amanda does our helps with our smoking model. Uh, Rick has been instrumental with all the MIF reagents. Um, I get lots of help from people like Infectious Disease Al Shaw, who does uh, translational work in uh, TLR and NLR in human PBMC. So he, he really helped us with many of the protocols. And the recruitment is completely done by the program on aging and all funded by the PEPPER. Otherwise, I wouldn't be able to get people who are between the ages of 65 and 90 who are smokers. And it's just incredibly challenging. But they've been, their field work, and kind of their guidance has been uh, instrumental in us getting our COPD years. And then, um, of course, funding. So thank you very much.